So thank you. Um, I'm Lexi Wessel, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a child and forensic psychiatrist based in the Division of Law and Psychiatry. And um, this Grand Rounds today is um, sort of loosely around the topic of art as it intersects with psychiatry, which I think is a very interesting and important thing. And I just wanted to mention that it's sponsored by this Rumsey Cartier Foundation. Um, who I'm hoping will continue to sponsor this sort of thing on an annual basis. Um, so I think that art is relevant to child psychiatry and I think vice versa. And um, I, I think it's relevant to child psychiatry, I, just to give you an example, this is a drawing of a five-year-old, a girl called Nadia, um, which any of you who've drawn before know that it would be, it's sort of almost unimaginable that a five-year-old could create something like this. And I, um, as a kid growing up, interacted with her and um, knew even then that she was very different than um, I was, um, that she could do things that I, there, it was absolutely impossible for someone like um, me to do. And um, I think another example of this is a guy called Stephen Wiltshire, who created a very, very perfect drawing of the city of Rome after spending a couple of hours in a helicopter over it. And it's a, it's a sort of wonderful illustration that minds work in very different ways. So the way we see the world is not necessarily the way other people see the world. Um, so I think there are other overlaps between art and um, psychiatry and child psychiatry, but I think most importantly to our topic today, um, I think our speaker, Lizzie Rockwell's work is in a way the same work that we do um, in a place like the Child Study Center. Both of us are committed to the goal of bettering children's lives, to making children's lives better. Um, and we do it at different stages of um, their lives and in, in different circumstances. But um, in Lizzie's work, I, um, as a parent, see things that I would really love to share with my kids. And I think if all kids read Lizzie Rockwell's work, um, things would be very, very good. Um, her art is also very beautiful, and she talks about a number of different topics and writes about a number of different topics, things I'm interested in, like birds and tools and chocolate, <laughs> but um, also um, a number of other things. So I think Lizzie um, went to school in Connecticut. She went to Con Connecticut College and studied art and um, what was your other? You had art, history. art history there too. And then went to the School of Visual Arts uh, um, in New York where she studied illustration and also drawing. And it's a really big honor to introduce her today. So I would like to Welcome Lizzie Rockwell. Um, not only is she great, as you'll see, but she's also a very lovely person. So thank you for coming today. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so happy uh, to be here with you. Um, I do a lot of presentations to five and six year olds, and so I kind of switch it up a little bit when I'm going to be talking to grown ups. Um, and I don't really know your background, I know a little bit about where you might be coming from, but I think we are all um, devoted to the well being of children. And um, that will definitely be a theme in my, in my talk today. Okay. And thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Okay, so I've been making books for a long time. Um, the first book that I illustrated was in 1989, and the first book that I wrote was in 1999. A lot of my books are up here on the table. Um, I often collaborate with my mother, Anne Rockwell. So if some of you have been working in child care um, or raised children a while ago, you probably came across my mom's um, books at some point. These are books that we've done together. Uh, she wrote all of these and I illustrated them. Um, the first one that we did together was Apples and Pumpkins. And the books that I write are often nonfiction science themes. Uh, I love science. Science um, helps the world make sense to me and um, it brings kind of logic and pattern into the universe. I like those things. 
Um, and for children, who I think like those things too, I like explaining very, very complex things in as few words as possible. Um, it kind of brings an elegance into the chaos around us. Uh, when I worked on Good Enough to Eat, which is the first book that I wrote, I spent um, about four years on the text. I did three entirely different versions, three different um, book dummies, which is the sketch phase I'll talk more about, uh, three different titles. But I had settled upon an opening line that I stuck with, which was, babies cry when they're hungry. So you know, if I can get to some crux of the matter, that hunger is uncomfortable, and uh, we get these strong signals to pay attention to it, so it must be important, um, then I know if I stick with it, I'll, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Um, my start in books, though, goes back much further. So like many fortunate children, uh, books were a big part of my childhood. Our house was filled with them. These are amongst my favorites, and they were made right in my house by my parents, Harlow and Ann Rockwell. Their studio was off our living room <clears throat> in Old Greenwich, Connecticut, and my brother Ollie, my sister Hannah, and I were all welcome to visit. So this is Ollie in a corner of the <coughs> studio. Uh, and we were encouraged to participate. So when one of my dad's old, uh, well, one of my dad's sable watercolor brushes got a little frayed at the edges, then he would hand it off to me. Um, so these books were made in my home, and sometimes my home and my family experiences were in the books. So this is the house I grew up in, our little light blue BW square back, our babysitter Mary, and my brother's messy room. We raised polywogs in our kitchen while my parents worked on this book, written by my mom and illustrated by my dad. Uh, once my alter ego, Gypsy Girl, even got her own book. <laughs> Along with my parents' books, I had many favorites by other authors. I still own these, along with hundreds of others, and I read them to my children when they are growing, were growing up. My children are now 25 and 28. Books need no electricity, no cables, no satellites, no passwords. Yet books are powerful objects. Books help us relate to familiar places and outings. They help us find our place in the family. So just make note that I'm going to show you a whole bunch of spreads from books, and they're not by me. The, um, the credit will be given on this slide. Books help us talk about complex relationships with the people around us. Um, and these books are all from my shelf. <laughs> Books can model a child living in a safe and cozy home who is free and confident enough to venture out into the big wild world. Books help us find our place in the wider world of school and community. They model social norms and healthy interactions between friends. Books help us realize that the world existed long before we did. and that the world is large, and nice and interesting people live all over it. Books explain the mysteries of the natural world and encourage us to explore and protect the earth and the animals who live on it. Books pass along the folklore and legends that come from our heritage and form our cultural literacy. Books sometimes have kind heroes who solve problems and allow good to overcome evil. Books can reassure us that no matter how bad things might get, there's probably a solution. With books, we begin to understand cause and effect. Books give us a safe place to start conversations or relate to difficult things like mortality and loss. 
With the help of books, we learn that our emotions are normal. Everybody has them. We find out that those wild feelings inside of us are not so strange. And that that wild side can be managed through imagination and play. Books help us understand that feelings have names. This is a board book about this big, and I don't know what I would have done without it as a parent. Words are powerful tools. Books define all the objects around us. Objects that may seem ordinary to us are dynamic and captivating to a child. Books show us that there is a name for every living thing on Earth. Things we can now name can be organized into categories. Categories help us sort out the complex universe and feel safe in it. Through books, we learn the secret code of written language. And books are entertaining. They can be funny, irreverent, action-packed. Books teach us about the world, the familiar and not so familiar parts. They give names to things and feelings. Books are our guide to understanding relationships and the difference between right and wrong. Books are little works of art that even a baby can own and hold. And if that baby is lucky, that experience is shared with a loving adult. The first impression of discovering the wonders in a book is mingled with the warmth of skin, the sound and feel of another heartbeat, the scent, and the emotional exchange of human bonding. Books can come in a form, books come in a form so simple and accessible a child can be guided to make his own version. I'm currently working with some preschools in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I live. We're making books together. We are learning what exactly books are. Books have front and back covers. Books have titles. Books have authors. Books have words and pictures inside. Books have sentences. Seeing one's own image and words in a book for the first time is an empowering experience. The synapses triggered feel good. Whether pushing a shell through the sand or a marker on paper, self-expression is exhilarating. Once introduced to that feeling, the child likely wants to feel this way over and over again. Self-expression is fun and it's hard. It requires focus and resilience in the face of unexpected distractions. I can relate. My studio is in a room in my house in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Like every workplace, I have a variety of special tools. I make all my artwork by hand. I use the computer for office work, refining and editing manuscript, and sometimes manipulating or sending um, an image electronically. And so now I'd like to tell you a little bit about how a book is made. I often do the initial writing by hand. Um, I don't know about you, but I think science is hard to explain. Um, editors are a big help to me in this process. In order to draw things, I often need visual reference. My son, Nigel, helped me on the Busybody book. And I will just um, go back for one second and say that the Busybody book is one of the three books I've written and illustrated about wellness. So the first book was Good Enough to Eat, which um, was hard won, uh, and it was about nutrition. And the Busybody book was about fitness, because nutrition without physical activity is um, not the whole picture. So each of these books led me to an idea for another book. And as a parent, these were major issues I was struggling with um, raising my children. 
And then um, later I did a book called Plants Feed Me that winnowed it down to a simpler message. Okay. Um, and his friends helped me too. <coughs> so I can draw a lot from my head and I'm going to do that for you soon. <laughs> Terrifying, but um, I do need to see what things look like. Even simple things like walking or running can be hard to draw. Uh, so coming up with images to go with the words is also hard. I try out my ideas as quick thumbnail sketches. So these are huge blow-ups of drawings that are actually, you know, about that big. Um, if I'm onto something in my thumbnail, then I will develop it as a sketch in the book dummy. Um, these sketches are drawn in hand, by hand, um, in a handmade book that is the size of the actual, that the actual book will be made, printed at. Uh, some changes are made along the way, but the basic concept from, thumb, from the thumbnail is the essence of these finished spreads. <coughs> and here I want, to, um, I want to demystify the science. I wanted to show what the body looked like on the inside. When I was a child, I was very obsessed with our big fat dictionary that had the, the see-through cellophane pages of all the body systems. And I would stand on a stool, because it was on a, pet, on a podium, to look at it. And I can just remember like the feel of those pages. So I knew if I was interested in it, somebody else was. Um, but I also want to make it connect to the child who maybe isn't that interested in science, but loves to play and run, or you know, is into fashion. Or <laughs> you know, I want children to find themselves in the pages, even when it's an informational book. When I was writing and illustrating Plants Feed Me, I did most of my research in my backyard. I grew peas from seed, which grew tall. And I observed and recorded their changes in my sketchbook. And this helped me make it a better picture. Right now, I'm working on a book called A Mammal is an Animal. Uh, I wrote my first draft in a spiral notebook by hand. I typed and edited it, it on the computer, and I worked. then I worked on the imagery. Um, like always, I started with small thumbnail sketches. So can anyone tell what this picture on the bottom is of from the thumbnail? A cow. A cow, A cow good. I haven't decided if the head is going to be up or down. Pregnant cow. A pregnant cow, yep. <laughs> and then a newborn cow and a nursing cow. And then a family with a nursing baby and interacting with books and other mammals. So from the text, I know that I'm going to have that, se that sequence of um, distinguishing mammalian gestation um, from you know, all other animals. So, well, no, sorry. There are some annoying animals that do give live birth that aren't mammals, but we're not even going to talk about that. <laughs> um, but so I have the, the birds and the eggs and then the gestation and then the birth and the, the nursing, which is the, the big mammal story. So then I make my book dummy. Um, I, it came... It came back to me from the editor and the art director at Holiday House, where it's being published, with lots of comments on post-it notes. So some are design comments, some are technical comments, some are just questions, like things they'd like me to, to uh, follow up on, make sure I'm correct. Um, it also went to a scientist, a zoologist, for vetting. Um, so I do my research as best I can. I did a lot of observing of my dog, Reggie, who's in the book. That was easy. He would kind of lie still for me to draw him. Um, cows, I have seen a lot of cows in real life. I also did a lot of research on the internet um, for imagery of cows. And I decided to focus in on the Holstein cow because uh, it's so graphic and black and white. Um, so I learned about them inside and out. And I even watched videos of calves being born. Many videos of calves being born. 
It was so fascinating, but you got to be ready for it. <laughs> uh, so I practiced drawing cows in my sketchbook. And then I was ready to do my incline drawing for the final illustration. I use a light box. I put the tracing paper drawing under the heavy watercolor paper on a light box, which glows. And then I can see my drawing underneath. And then I ink it with a, a very fine tip micron pen. Do we have any artists in the room? OK, good. Because otherwise, <laughs> the, those details are kind of boring. Um, and then I paint it. And I've drawn a lot of animals in books, a lot of birds, but there's something about mammals. Their eyes, even, even a humpback whale has an expressive warmth in its eye that a fish just doesn't have. <laughs> Sorry, Lexi, I just don't see it in the fish. <laughs> They're beautiful. But the, the psychology of mammals is quite striking. Um, I'm using Hydra's uh, fluid watercolors for this book. Little, the little drawings you see in the background are little sketches and studies and practices I do to get ready. Um, this is what my drawing table looks like when I am refining a complex picture. So this is a scene in the book, early on in the book, that is going to show a biodiverse landscape, a forest, sort of New England forest landscape, with a cross section of underground, um, so we could see what's in the pond, what's, you know, the, the, the fox, um, nursing her cubs in her den. And um, here it is traced. And now I'm working on the painting. And when I go home today, I'll probably work in my garden. I'll probably work on this tomorrow. <laughs> OK, so thank you. That is, that is my slide presentation. I definitely need a good like uh, 20 minutes to do the drawing, but I because I'm gonna we're gonna do some I'm gonna do a spontaneous drawing for you with your help. Well, that'll be the grand finale. But it, before I start that, I just would love to take some questions um, if anybody has questions or comments. Yes. That was fun. Oh, good. A comment <laughs> and a question is: Oh, what are your thoughts about the repetitive nature? We have some thoughts about it, of, of books for kids at night. You know, if you skip a word, oh, oh my gosh, go back to that page. Having to hear the same thing for the, for the bedtime ritual. Just as a writer. Oh, why do children like yeah, to hear it? Yeah, what's your thoughts about it? Yeah. I think that there is, as I mentioned this a couple of times, I think there's a very stabilizing thing about books. Um, they're still, they're quiet, they're always the same. Um, and I think they do like knowing that something in the world is like that. Mm. That's my, I'm, yeah. you all probably know way better than I do. No, yeah. But from my perspective, writer, yeah. I feel that there is a very uh, soothing quality to something that is always there and always the same. And now more than ever, the world is shifting and changing just constantly and, and visually things in front of our eyes are in constant motion and they change if you touch them by accident and, you know so I think children are they're like us too they're they're growing up with uh, what do they call it uh, cyber nativists or computer <coughs> the natives of the computer world where we're you know we're visitors <coughs> uh, well some of you are young and they like to tell the story you can catch them quietly sometimes when they're by themselves, yeah. telling a story as you read it to yes, them. Yes, with your tone. With your tone themselves, sort of practicing for something, exactly. or comforting. Yeah, yeah, almost keeping you with them at that moment if they need that, you know? Um, yeah, I had, uh, I don't know if any of you know this book by Virginia Lee Burton, it's called Life Story, and it's the story from the Big Bang to like, cities and dinosaurs and trilobites and everything in between. It's 64 pages long. And I would read that to my son Nicholas 10 times in a row. He just couldn't get enough of it. And it was such a complex, weird book, but it made him feel very <clears throat> calm, you know? So thank you for that question. I liked it. Any other questions? How long does it take? 
from start to finish. You said your first one yeah. book was four years. But. They don't. They shouldn't take that long. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, that book has sold well over the years, so it's kind of ended up being worth it. But um, they take it generally. I can write a first draft of something literally in a day. It might be something I've been thinking of for many years, um, decades, but um, it will suddenly often come to me almost as a whole thing. Usually when I'm walking the dog or driving or just waking up, I have to be like nowhere near my studio to write something. It doesn't come there. Um, but then refining the text will take several months um, and you know, with back and forth with the editor, going to the expert reader, for nonfiction at least. And then illustrating can take anywhere from a minimum of three months to six months to a year to, to do the, the finished artwork. And often I'm doing other things in the midst of that. I have a lot of different tasks that I need to do, and I do a lot of presenting and you know, um, teaching and stuff. So. Yes, dear. Hello. Uh, these are wonderful. These are so great. And um, uh, you mentioned that when you start out, it's very scary to put your thoughts on paper, and I have a little one myself who used to do these wonderful intricate drawings, and now he's reached an age where I said, oh, do you want to do some more drawing? And he said, no, because I'm not as good as some of the other kids that he sees. So I was wondering how we can encourage those kids who suddenly realize that other people are watching what they're drawing and keep that inner creativity going. Every five-year-old is really a great artist. You know, there's different levels of complexity, but the, the level of honesty and um, ob observation and spontaneity, it's there in almost every five-year-old. Whereas 12-year-olds are very hard to get to draw. And so it's wonderful that we, we become socialized, we become interactive human beings, we develop theory of mind and empathy and all these things we're going to need in life. We can't stay five forever. But um, we become self-aware in a, in a restrictive way, too. We become intimidated. We become embarrassed so easily. We don't want to take that risk of drawing. So I, I, teach, I teach a lot um, of classes to all ages. And on my website, there's actually, you have to dig a little bit to get into it. It's, in the teaching section of my website, I have student galleries that shows a lot of student work. And, um, and I, I have found methods <clears throat> to reach even the, the most, you know, sort of self-conscious, intimidated kids. Uh, I do a lot of drawing with things you can't erase. So drawing with markers or pens and using watercolor that you can't go back. Um, I worked with a group of, of adolescents who were, um, uh, early on in the incarceration system, you know, in Norwalk, Connecticut, and they, they had had brushes with the law, and they were in a therapeutic program run by Family and Children's Agency, and I worked with them over the summer, and I developed an abstract watercolor uh, technique with them to paint without drawing, without subject matter, you know, just go all Jackson Pollock on it or whatever you need to do, and that there's no right or wrong, and it's not trying to look like anything. So I think cutting out um, ultimate goals is one good way to help children um, feel freer. There's no expectation, even their own expectation of where they're going with it. And I had one girl in this program, she was really, uh, very hard to not to crack, and she was so mad about being there, and she just starts sort of slashing, you know, the page with her brush, and of course it was wonderful, and you know, and even she was like, oh, okay, can I have another piece of paper, and you know, so I think it's just it's just however we can break down the expectations, and so when I draw for you spontaneously here. Um, I am very prepared for it to go badly. It often does, but it's it's yeah, yeah. interesting in that <laughs> the risk of it is makes it more interesting. So, any other questions? Uh, just that all of the books are transitioning into this digital world and catalog. So, what are your thoughts about how to 
seems like obviously the physical hold of the book in that plays a major role. Yeah. So, any yes. About that? Thank you for bringing that up because I'm trying not to be, you know, just. Can you repeat the question? For every yeah. Um, he's asking about how how I feel about um, the digital form for children's media, and um, that so much more of what they're coming in contact is digital. And I will tell you, the publishers 10 years ago were all like, oh my gosh, it's a revolution. We're going to have to do everything different. And they were totally prepared for no more paper. And I just kept thinking, what? No, no, no. And I, did, I even had a friend who's a children's book illustrator. And he said, no, but it'll be so great because you could change the ending. And you, know, you can do whatever you want. And I was like, no, like I don't want to work on Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, like shift things around a little bit. Like I want works of art to be there as I expect them to be. Like that to me is a great thing. And I think a lot of children feel that about books. So the more digital a book is, the more likely it is that we can push a button and it'll be, in a, it'll be spoken for us. We don't have to read it. We push a button, it'll be in a different language. And then why not if it's possible make it so you could color it in differently and change the art and and I think then it's not a book anymore you know mm -hmm. um, what I was saying before and I think you'll notice when you work with children is they do like stability they do like things that they can come back to that are always the same I've held on to those books for over 50 years I'm handing them on to my kids they'll hand them on to their kids I have a whole drawer full of old phones that whatever was on them, I don't know, I've just, I'll never see it again. Whereas these books, these physical books will stay the same and be there as long as, you know, we want them to be. So I, I also just, I don't think we have the science yet to know what children's brains need in terms of still images. Um, tactile turning of a page, the, the, I think the interaction with the human is much less likely if we're doing it digitally mm -hmm. because digital things are things we give children to keep them out of our hair for an hour so we can boil the pasta. I mean, it's necessary um, to, to keep your children self, you know, self-reliant, um, but we don't want to lose that early bonding, you know, that is, the, a book is the perfect way to do it. It's just such a natural, and, and even if it's a caregiver in a preschool, you know, they will, they will cuddle with the children. Right. Do I have any preschool teachers here? Yeah, well, I used to be a... <laughs> okay, or, or, or young child educators? Yeah. Early childhood yeah. development, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, but, you know, they're very much in the parental role, um, and they, they are very physical with the children, and they need that. They need that physical contact. Um, oh, I have one. Um, nice to meet you. I'm from Hi. NCC, um, Norway Community oh, College. Oh, wonderful. Thank um, you. My teachers love you. By the way, they say hi. Awesome. Um, I'm Jennifer Wood, and oh, my other nice. teacher is Donna Kanoi. Yeah. So, um, Tell them I say hi. <laughs> yes, they love you. So um, about the books, uh, I guess it it makes a sense of security when when children read them, touch them, as you said. Yeah. And why they read the the, the book <clears throat> the same time a lot of times, like for every stage and every month. So it builds like a pattern in their brain, like oh, we're reading this back and forward, and it's every page is like new for them because they're developing. So every stage. Yeah. Um, that was his question, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was concerned. I'm not not concerned. I was having like this uh, question to you. Your books has a, a theme, right? Like for what is going around their environment, right? Like um, uh, animals, um, their weather, the living. Are you going to? I don't know if I haven't read them all. I I'm really familiar with your books. Um, like some issues that children at early stages they are um, having, like for example, um, right now I'm studying divorce in early childhood development mm -hmm. and how do this um, affects in children. So I don't know if you're willing to 
um, address some issues that we as a caregiver so we yeah. deal with with um, <coughs> trying to make resiliency in these children yeah I get a lot of my ideas from teachers you know um, and from being a parent and from seeing what children need um, I haven't done a book on divorce yet you know I, I did a book about a new baby coming into the family hello baby um, but I kind of I knew there were a lot of books about jealousy and and feeling threatened by the new baby so I thought well maybe we just um, give some hard facts, you know, mm. like that a way of dealing with emotion sometimes is information and that we can be soothed by knowing things. So knowing what's going on, I, I do a lot of in utero <laughs> illustration apparently, it's just a thing. Um, but yeah, I'm very interested in what needs doing. When I did the nutrition book, there wasn't a book about nutrition for children. There were aisles and aisles of books at Barnes & Noble about nutrition for adults, but there hadn't been one for no. child. So when you see a need, <clears throat> the, somebody says it to you, and then maybe five years later, it sort of pops up. Yeah, blossoms. Yep. Lizzie, I, I'm mindful of time, and yeah. I, I would love for people to see you in yeah, action, yeah. because Good. a lot of this is not wordable. And, um, right. Right, okay. So, good, thank you. I'm bad, very bad at watching. I think that our chair, Linda May, should... Uh, I set timers for myself. Pick, uh, yeah, so make this random. is grab bag um, drawing. Okay. So let's see if that's a picture. Uh, it's a picture of baking ingredients, flour and um, measuring spoons. I illustrate a lot of games for this toy company, Ebu, which are really wonderful paper cardboard games. And so these are all tiles from my game. We're just going to pull out four tiles and a clamp, like you would build something with. Okay. And now we need, what does this story need? Characters. Okay. Yes. Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> <laughs> And the three bears. Okay. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't you expect that? Uh -huh. <laughs> the last time that Lizzie was here, Humpty Dumpty featured. Could we do a, a redo in Humpty Dumpty yeah. just so that people don't think that there's a, a yeah. fix here? Okay, you pick. I pick. Okay. <laughs> no, you pick. You pick. Yeah, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> yeah, Humpty he Dumpty. likes to ride the owl. Do we have to a frog? Frog, frog prints. Okay. okay. So, now I do this a lot with children, and actually I recommend it to any of you who work with children. Um, pull random things out, particularly if there can be sort of an emotional element, like a character, and just start to make connections. Um, so, if I have the three bears, the frog prints, the clamp, and the baking stuff, how could these possibly go together in a picture? But first, we're just gonna we're gonna uh, brainstorm for five minutes and throw out a few ideas because I'm not gonna decide. You guys are gonna decide. So what I'll say to kids is, um, and actually, you know what? I think I'm gonna put the three bears back because that's so many characters. Let's do. Um, let's do. Now this is totally cheating because I'm not supposed to look. But let's do the. Gingerbread man, okay? Okay. okay. Um, the frog prince, gingerbread man, the clamp, and the baking goods. So I will say to the kids, do the frog prince and gingerbread man know each other? They're going to be in the picture together. Are they going to be aware of each other? Um, did they just meet? Have they known each other for a long time? If they know each other, how do they feel about each other? So think about it. Even if you're just standing in an elevator, just you and one other person who you've never met before, there's an interaction. There's a weird energy that just bounces between people when they are in the same space. So help me think about how these guys um, are going to interact. And will those clamp, will the clamp and the baking materials help us think of an activity, a scenario, a setting, or something that we could start to build a story with? They're old friends. They're in old the same friends. neighborhood. Okay, they grew up in the same neighborhood. Okay, so um, 
What they are they doing? They haven't seen each other for a while. They haven't seen each other for a while. That sets up a narrative for sure. Okay. And why are they why are they together this time? Does it have anything to do with the props? The gingerbread man is looking for a spouse and needs to bake another gingerbread. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if only it were so easy. <laughs> Just uh -huh. come up with the perfect mate. Okay, I love and that. And the prince offered to help. Right. Because the prince happens to be That's good at, the perfect you know. clam to <laughs> tweak. You know, because there baking you is not enough. Everybody knows that you can't just bake right. a new partner. You need to clamp things down. <laughs> <laughs> that might come later. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to start because this is hard enough. And, um, <laughs> okay, and then the kids, no offense, but the kids are much more um, generous with their ideas. <laughs> and so like, oh, you know, and they've got a million different scenarios and often this would be interesting too. Very violent. Very violent scenarios. That, that I didn't say the clamp was a gentle clamp. Right. right. <laughs> so I actually like took the wolf out of the bag because every time the kids would get the wolf, just blood and gore, and and, and I was like, oh, that doesn't really sound like a Lizzie Rockwell drawing. <laughs> um, okay. So. That work? Yep. Yeah. So usually I draw on the easel. This is the first time <clears throat> we're doing it like this. So we've got the gingerbread man. Gingerbread man is um, Maybe a little worried. <laughs> um, we're looking at him from the top, so we're getting a little perspective on his flat head and then his hair. And so I always start kind of with the eyes and the, <coughs> the face and then the hands. So I think maybe. Got to do all the weird <coughs> perspective on his body too. But anyway, so he's using a big uh, gingerbread lady <laughs> cookie lady cutter. <laughs> um, and oh, the perspective drawing on this is too hard. You see, it's a cookie cutter, so. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Is that okay? And then yeah, it's going to connect or something like I don't know. You get the idea. And then there's a big. The dough. And um, so we'll put the measuring cup that he's already used over here. And, uh, and then the like the nonpareils that you need to put the eyes in over here, um, and the that will help him give her a really nice expression, the frosting. <laughs> okay, so then he's on the counter. And then, where am I going to put the frog? So, because of this scenario, I got so involved with the interaction between the gingerbread man and his future spouse <laughs> that I kind of forgot about the frog. But the frog maybe is. Um, could be in his mind. Could be in his mind. Oh. 
<laughs> if only the frog were here, and he would help me. He would draw the face. Or the frog. He could be peeping be... in at a from a door. Yeah, yeah I think the frog. Exactly. He's come by to see his old friend. Is is maybe the best man. Best man. <laughs> right, going to be the best man. <laughs> <laughs> best frog. Sometimes in an illustration, you can have. One character know about the character, about the interaction, but the other one not yet know it. So, Frog is leaping in. And now I have to draw in perspective. from the outside. <laughs> and there's curtains. Nice kitchen with curtains. And then um, we'll show the <coughs> landscape. We'll show the pond where he originated. <laughs> the cattails. The lily pads. I'm currently drawing a pond, so that's easy. Um, the background, the the castle, where the frog resides. But he just bought it, so the gingerbread man didn't know that he was yet in the neighborhood. Um, and the clamp. Oh, but okay. So this is one moment. But what if, what if we thought about the next moment? I have to do that in frosting, which makes it a little weird. No, it would be even bigger or wider. <coughs> So we'll, well, I liked him better before. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll do. He's looking. But maybe he's feeling a little better about her. Okay. And uh, the clamp is. Frog recognizes the importance of keeping the dough still. With that. So he's bringing him a clamp. He's bringing, oh, he's carrying the clamp. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I like, I, otherwise, it's going to just be so. So he's bringing a clamp. Maybe because um, when he has the new spouse, the frog knows. He's going to need to build a, a better <coughs> house or an addition. And he's also a carpenter. <laughs> um, so he's bringing the clamp. And, um, and then we'll talk, you know, maybe a little more about setting and creating details, the cabinets and um, and maybe even a silent character. Because there are no mammals really in this picture. I'm oh. into mammals right now. <laughs> and now I can play Yahtzee. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Couldn't get rid of it. Okay. But this is a great 
Um, Love it. <laughs> it is a really fun activity to do with kids um, because they they just can't wait to make connections between you know silly things. They love that uh, finding, um, you know, just the, the anything. So do you think of it as a projective technique as to what's on their minds and what they're coming up with as a solution to this? You know, well, you learn a lot about, yeah, yeah about what they're thinking. We learned about sure. you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I learned about you because right. you gave you. you gave yeah. <laughs> No gingerbread for you tonight. <laughs> um, and what I, what I also like kids to understand when I when I draw an illustration, you to understand is that an illustration, um, at least the kind I do in in books, they're narrative illustrations. So they're storytelling pictures, and a storytelling picture has um, something happening in it, which usually involves a living thing. Um, and usually involves some potential for change. So we can imagine what was going on before this moment. So if you asked a child to draw, well, what's the scene, what scene would you like to draw before this? They might say, well, the gingerbread man is shopping at the grocery store for the flower, or the, the ginger man just woke up and said, I feel so lonely, I need, you know, a gingerbread lady. Um, and where was the frog? You know, like how did he find his way to this house and, you know, decide to pick that moment to surprise his friend? And um, so we like to, it helps us think about time, you know, that, that every moment is in flux and that something just happened and another thing's going to happen two minutes, two years, a million years from now. So it's, it's, books do that too because they're still images. They turn the page and something new happens and we can make predictions about what might happen next um, and we can always talk about you know how the characters are feeling and relate it back to our own experiences so art and books books are art I mean I think children's books are art and they inspire children to make their own art and tell their own stories so they're really handy tool Okay, so unless you have questions, I or I'd happy to, to look at stuff up here with look, you, yeah. or um, and just thank you so much for having me. No,